Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming today to our webinar, From Hospital to Home, Planning the Discharge Journey. This is the second of three online events being hosted by Tubby Tai. Uh, last week, we launched our research into experiences of staff from housing department and local government during the last year and what they see as opportunities. We had a really interesting discussion with those attending, discussing what they see as the opportunity in terms of rapid rehousing and ensuring long-term solutions to some of the problems that they've overcome in the last year, but also the real impact that the pandemic and working through the pandemic has had on the mental health of staff. Next week, we're hosting a discussion on the support in the private rented sector during COVID. All our events are free, you can sign up on our website and recordings are available afterwards. All of the information we're talking about today is on our website. Um, please feel free to get in touch if you'd like to know more about what we talk about today or about all of our work generally. It'd be great to hear from everyone. Uh, now that that plug is over, I'm going to quickly introduce Tubby Tai. We are a five year research and policy project funded by Oak Foundation and based within the membership body for housing professionals, the Chartered Institute of Housing. Next slide, please. Our previous reports within Tabby Tai have included perceptions of social housing, housing and homelessness, looking at local government reform, uh, reports based on the forums we've held across the country, speaking to housing professionals, to tenants, to people across different sectors about what really matters in housing, a report looking into the private rented sector and mental health and support to tenants and landlords within the private rented sector, and also looking at community solutions to empty homes. Next slide, please. In autumn 2019, we published a report which set out the principles of what made a good partnership between housing, health and social care organisations. This piece of work was funded by the UK Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence and was based on interviews with organisations and successful partnerships across Wales. Some of these partnerships include health and housing hubs, social prescribing projects, cross-sector coalitions and community-based services and were all examples of where organisations have come together to work in a partnership in a way that's really meaningful and importantly long term has continued to deliver successful um, outcomes for the clients within the services. Next slide please. What we found was that there were six elements of what made a really strong partnership between the organisations. The first, shared analysis. This is where individuals had come together and sat down to understand the problems, their concerns, but also importantly, the areas for improvement and had come up with a collaborative shared analysis of what those issues are and what the solutions might be. Secondly, a successful partnership within this sector needs to be based on person-centred care. The individual at the heart of the um, services was really important. The third principle we came across was that of leadership. And what was interesting about this was that it all wasn't always leadership from the top, that it could be individuals with an organisation who have a drive and a passion to make a change coming together with like minded individuals from other organisations. But it is important to make sure you're bringing along the senior management team within your partnerships in order to have that long term impact that we all want to have. Fourth, we found joint budgets really important. It's really key that all the organisations feel they have a stake in the successful outcome of the partnership and the service it's delivering. But that isn't always budget, because some, for some it may be a budgetary input, for others it could be staff time, it could be location, or it could be knowledge and um, experience that they're willing to share. The fifth um, partnership principle we found was that was a shared interpretation of legislation. And this is really interesting working in Wales. We have the Future Generations Act and within that, the, the drive that we work in collaboration, that it's not just about getting the outcomes we want, it's how we do it and the partnerships should be part of that. And for some partnerships, what they found was that that was a really good way to bring along possibly slightly more reluctant organisations by reminding them of their duties under the Future Generations Act and the Wellbeing and Social Services Act. Finally, the recognition of power and balance. This was really useful and interesting realisation that we had that it, while it is within all partnerships, there will often be one partner who has more money, who has more influence, more sway. 
but that is just almost inevitable but it's really important to talk about that to talk about the difference that that makes within the partnerships and the good partnerships were the ones who acknowledged that at the beginning of a process but also throughout the process recognize the different key elements that each partner organization brings to the successful service right that was my last slide um, I just really wanted to draw your attention to that piece of work because one area that stood out of it is needing further investigation because it's so important and because when it's done well, it makes such a difference, was that of hospital discharge. Understanding why it's important to get it right and what role housing advice does and should play in successful hospital discharge. I'm now going to hand over to um, the, the people we've been working with on this piece of work, Greg and Anthony, and they're going to talk us through their findings. There, sh there will be time at the end for questions and answers, so please do get your, your questions in. And um, we hope to address those as we go um, at the end of the presentation. Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Kath. Um, my name is Greg. Um, I work for an organization called CARP, and we are a social business uh, working across Wales, conducting uh, areas of research and evaluation across social care housing. Um, with me today is Anthony from Ghana Consulting, um, and we've known each other for quite some time, um, both having worked extensively across um, housing services, homelessness services, in terms of mental health as well over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, and we came together on this project, um, looking really, as Kath has outlined, um, providing um, or, or, or actually setting out a roadmap to cover five key areas. If I could have the next slide, please, Sarah. Um, so in terms of, of, of what, we, what we plan to do, I'm actually with the research, as Kath has said, um, it fits in really to the third strand um, of, of the program that um, she heads up, looking about housing's role in, in how that can keep people well, healthy and in their own homes. Um, and I know today that you'll have uh, had access to the full body of the report. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to talk you through that. Um, so yes, in terms of the rationale, five key areas looking to provide um, a contemporary analysis of how and when housing advice is actually used in the discharge planning process. Um, providing a picture where we can of the impact of COVID, which, which clearly has, has had significant impact across all, all areas of service provision over the last 15, 15 to 18 months in Wales and, and um, obviously the UK. Um, and then having a look at to see if there's a variation um, in the way that housing advice is, is applied um, across the health board areas in Wales and to see if we could, we could find out any, any reasons that actually sat behind that. At the same time, we wanted to have a focus on people with a protected characteristic within that setting. Um, and we'll talk you through something around that a little bit later on. Um, and quite obviously, we were, we were really keen and interested just to have a look at areas um, of good practice that could either improve the effectiveness of, of the process of hospital discharge or provide that um, experience of learning that could be shared actually with other people. If I can have the next slide, please, Sarah. Um, as part of the research, we, we, we did an extensive um, review of existing policy documents and literature covering everything from uh, the series of reports prepared by the Wales Audit Office in 2017 for every health board area around hospital discharge, looking at delayed transfers of care, um, and we'll talk about the importance of that a little bit later, um, and as well covering particular documents either through health board areas or in terms of local authorities around discharge planning, particularly with an emphasis where um, people were having to conduct that, that process in, in what we know now as the midst of a pandemic. Um, and then we started really of thinking about, well, what does housing advice mean? You know, how, how do you look at it? How do you actually clarify it as a definition? Because we wanted to start with the interviewees. Um, and we, we contacted around about 150 plus people across Wales. We conducted just in excess of 50 interviews. We put out a survey monkey. Um, had about 17, I think 17 responses on that as well. But we wanted to start off really with having a, a clear idea so that everybody had a, had a clear understanding about what we talked about. So housing advice, working with our colleagues in CAH Cymru, um, we took an existing definition that came from Care and Repair Cymru, as you see there on the screen, that housing advice actually refers to the 
provision of expert, comprehensive and integrated housing care, financial issues and support, namely access to appropriate housing and supporting people to maintain and sustain what they actually have as a home. And I think when we went out and spoke to people around that, every, everybody bar one that we talked to saw housing advice as encompassing some of those broader issues. They didn't see it necessarily just as a bricks and mortar issue. Um, so we, we, we put that out, as I say, and, and, and we use that as a guide for all of the interviews that we actually um, took place because we, we, we felt that that would give us that clear sort of baseline to actually work from. Um, and then in the course of the interviews, um, it was quite clear that, that, that everybody that we, that we spoke to, and this is housing staff, this is hospital staff, this is staff based in social services, all of whom might work in a, in a, in a different range of locations, some in hospitals, some out in the community. But all of them demonstrated that they were conducting some level of housing advice intervention with the patients that they were actually working with. Um, and that included people who didn't come from a housing background. And from that, we were able to group them into three, three sort of clear teams, really. The first team really was the social work hospital discharge teams um, who really played a, a key role in all, all areas of planning a patient's hospital discharge um, home. Um, and within that group, um, clearly all of the interviewees covered broader elements that we had. Um, just in terms of housing advice and their work. The second housing option staff based with local authorities who obviously have, have the um, statutory duty um, and, and, and actually under the housing 15 to give housing, you know, to give formal housing advice. And the third one group was the obvious group, I suppose, in terms of nursing staff based on ward, almost all of whom demonstrated a wide understanding of housing issues. Um, and that was generally built over over a period of time that they may have been based on ward, their experience of working in that setting, but together as well, drawing on, um, you know, uh, you know, broader kind of team, team access, um, and some of the links that those people had, had actually put together. Um, and I think from any of the non health to that, that the, the ward based teams, should should provide housing, yeah. And equally as well, there was there was not a universal acceptance that everybody would need to have housing advice. Uh, there were two key expectations, really, that the point of referral and around the housing need should be timely, um, and that people would need access to appropriate advice as soon as possible. Um, and I think I think the second thing that we kind of drew out of that as well. Um, any advice provided by non-housing staff needed to be accurate, and it also needed to manage some of the expectations that people had um, as a patient about what housing options you know, would actually be there for them. If I can have the next slide, Sarah, and I'll hand over to Anthony just to take you through the next couple of sections. Thank you, Greg. So in terms of addressing hospital discharge, health staff and social worker interviewees confirmed that most patients being discharged are not homeless or threatened with homelessness and therefore most were not referred to their respective local authority housing options teams. Although no specific data on this could be sourced, one social worker in Torvine <coughs> excuse me, estimated that 99% of discharged patients on their caseload were not homeless or threatened with homelessness, with 60% of discharges involving adaptations and 80% requiring a variety of ongoing support once discharged. Of the cases that are referred to local authority housing departments, respondents from eight of the 11 local authorities who participated in the research stated that discharge cases relating to mental health were by far their most common challenge. Approximately half stated that they or the health board had directly addressed the issue by investing in dedicated roles to assist and facilitate patient discharge from mental health units. As an example, Caffili County Borough Council estimated that 90% of discharge cases they dealt with were mental health related uh, and have, in and have in introduced funded posts to manage referrals. In contrast, the city and county of Swansea estimated that 70% of their discharge cases were physical health rather than mental health related. One consideration here is that the S Swansea have not undergone the transfer of their housing stock and therefore discharges involving adaptations which are predominantly, if not entirely physical health related, still involve the local authority, 
or are directly dealt with by district housing offices. Our research indicated that hospitals, health boards and local authorities each took different approaches to addressing hospital discharge. Some had developed their own social work hospital discharge teams, whilst others created a range of teams or team roles, including a first point of contact team, patient flow coordinators, mental health link workers, discharge solutions officers, occupational therapy led discharge teams and individual specialist posts. These teams or roles facilitated discharge by working to bridge the interface between hospitals and the relevant community services and resources. Some hospital staff noted that their subsequent involvement with relevant housing bodies relied on well-established health-based professionals in a hospital setting who often played a key role in holding the process together and in linking up the relevant community-based services in a timely manner. These successes were achieved through long-standing working relationships and or where staff may have had prior working experience in a housing or other related setting. Whilst the need for additional staff posts was mentioned in interviews in the context of what could work better, an over-reliance on individuals or single specialist posts was identified as having the potential to create challenges. These challenges focused on staff developing an over-reliance on expert advice contained within a limited resource or by having the knock-on effect of de-skilling staff by taking them away from regular involvement in needs assessment, advice provision or discharge planning. Although not specifically mentioned by interviewees, the impact of gaps in service, service provision created by expert professionals moving on or leaving posts was apparent to our interview team. Staff in community-based services dealing with hospitals without dedicated teams or established health professionals coordinating discharge reported problems of not having a known point of contact. As an example, one interviewee indicated how hospital staff have been lucky to have housing staff housing advice staff available from their local authority to provide a service. In this case, they said housing staff did more than just offer advice, as they were also able to make referrals and assist with housing applications. In one area, it was identified that non-specific advice and support was provided for homeowners and support can be offered relating to household bills and to address neighbourhood issues. The presence of expert staff in health settings raises both the profile and importance of providing appropriate and tailored housing advice in addressing the wider non-clinical needs that patients may have. Input from staff with housing expertise can complement and support health professionals in meeting patients' needs in a holistic way. So with regards to, regards to discharge planning, although many professionals indicated that housing needs are identified as early in a patient's hospital stay as possible, there was an acknowledgement that housing needs were often not picked up at or soon enough after admission. The existence or use of a protocol or procedure was not regularly mentioned in our research interviews and where they were mentioned, a number of interviewees noted that it wasn't really followed. Other interviewees indicated that, that their approach to discharge planning was more down to an embedded practice and culture and with 25% of respondents stating that having a protocol that was implemented, understood and followed was needed in the discharge process. We felt that without a well-recognised hospital discharge protocol procedure in place that is actively followed by hospital staff and which adopts a multidisciplinary approach, there is a challenge in ensuring how hospital and community-based services can work effectively together on discharge planning. So in terms of identifying patient need, Ward-based staff highlighted that identifying wide-ranging patient needs to inform the development of a comprehensive discharge plan often presented the following challenges. Unless the patient is known to ward staff, excuse me, unless the patient is known to ward staff, they can only go by what the patient says, which was described as not always true, accurate or comprehensive. In interviews, some ward staff mentioned how family or carers can be helpful in providing information but to what extent this takes place was not entirely clear. Patients will sometimes say what they think nursing staff want to hear with a view to being discharged as soon as possible, understandably. Therefore, true housing need and situation might, may not always be true or, or known and can be difficult to establish. Again, the extent to which family or carers assist in establishing what matters was not clear. Patients are not always well enough or have capacity to discuss their needs or situation, especially soon after admission 
and it was not clear in our interviews how these needs were addressed. Advocacy services were mentioned by some respondents as a way of ensuring the patient's needs were duly considered. But to what extent this took place, this takes place, in addition to the involvement of family and carers, was again not clear. Prior to being admitted, mental health patients are sometimes assessed over a period of hours or even days and, and found not eligible for treatment and then discharged. If these patients are unable to return to the home they left, they then leave hospital with an immediate housing need, but without formal discharge planning taking place. The local authority who provided this as an example explained that because the assessed patient was not formally admitted, they were subsequently not formally discharged. Patients need to change throughout their hospital stay. Amputees were mentioned by a number of respondents as presenting particularly complex case management issues in respect of wound management, addressing physical health issues and addressing any needs associated with adapting the home layout. Adapting a home to ensure it was wheelchair friendly was described as a serious challenge, one which was not always possible and, circumstance, and a circumstance that occasionally resulted in alternative accommodation being required. Patients may discharge themselves prior to their needs being understood and discharge plans being in place. There being no obvious means to detain patients unless under mental health legislation. A number of interviewees noted that the complexity of a patient's discharge requirements impacted on being able to achieve a timely and appropriate discharge. Some complex discharge cases were described by respondents as situations where the patient's accommodation is identified as being unfit for habitation, or the patient's needs change throughout their stay in hospital, meaning their previous accommodation is no longer suitable at all or in its previous form. Interviewees cited several reasons in such situations relating to discharge, including special equipment such as hoists being required, which in turn require adequate space to be operated safely and effectively, wheelchairs being required, which may have specific space requirements, accommodation with stairs no longer being suitable due to changes in a patient's mobility and cases involving hoarding or other health and safety factors such as properties electrical wiring hazards and finally family not being willing to take a patient back into their home principally on account of mental health needs but also as a consequence of a patient's ongoing unique psychosocial needs Interview respondents also explained that accommodation can sometimes be adapted to meet the required, need, required needs, but this can be timely and costly, meaning grants first have to be accessed. However, it was also noted that even when new accommodation is required and secured, it can still need adaptation. Bariatric cases were given as specific examples where new doorways need to be built to enable movement throughout a property, but this can often present significant technical challenges. Discharge planning in practice. Although in interviews, most health professionals indicated that housing needs are identified as early in a patient's hospital stay as possible, from our research, it was apparent that the actual timing of discharge planning as an overall process presented a mixed picture. It was apparent that the process of identifying housing needs can be separate from the process of using that information to plan discharge. Uh, the What Matters assessment or just conversation was mentioned by some hospital staff as a document that addresses, amongst many things, the patient's housing situation. The use of this assessment was identified as a potential area of development for ward-based staff by one head of hospital discharge. Discharge planning varied widely from hospital to hospital, in some cases starting on or just after admission, and in other cases taking place a couple of weeks prior to discharge or even as late as when the patient is deemed discharge ready. The different hospital based fora used for discussing and planning discharge also varied, including ward rounds, ward based reviews, patient flow meetings, discharge planning meetings and of course MDTs. Having a rapid allocation system or process for referrals that is informed by the collaborative expertise of professionals could assist in formulating timely and accurate discharge plans. So with regard to the importance of a multidisciplinary approach in discharge planning, our research indicated that a multidisciplinary team approach with involvement of key professionals was an important factor in ensuring that discharge takes place in a safe and timely manner. 
As expected, MDTs included a range of health professionals, all of whom had a crucial role and were linking in social work hospital discharge teams if they weren't already involved. Such social services teams, specialist posts and dedicated community connected teams were often, if not always, involved in MDT meetings or other meetings involved in discharge planning and would subsequently play a key role in linking in relevant community based housing bodies. However, some community based services such as adult services and community mental health teams and the majority of res registered social landlords and housing options staff voiced some criticism that they were only occasionally invited to MDT meetings. They all added that they were ready and willing to engage and that their involvement would be a significant benefit in supporting timely and effective discharge. As an example, one service manager for a CMHT explained that her team were care coordinators and that their involvement in discharge planning was essential. However, she added that sometimes they only hear about a discharge after it had taken place. As positive, positive examples of multidisciplinary or multi-agency working, interviewees cited posts that were jointly funded between local authority and health, um, in which a specific professional was employed by either health or housing. Although beneficial in terms of an integrated approach to addressing discharge, some concerns were noted in relation to conflicting organisational priorities, frameworks and guidance. However, being based in a hospital setting enables staff with housing expertise to work collaboratively with health staff in an effective way. In such cases, staff frequently took on the role of linking in housing bodies and other community based services. With regard to information sharing, from our research, it is clear that some services were well integrated with shared IT systems, paperwork and assessments, offering equity and ease of access to patients' records across disciplines and directorates. Despite respondents describing the benefits of being able to access other departments' IT systems and records, the inconvenience of having to use multiple IT systems was highlighted. This was particularly the case where health and social services departments used different patient or client databases, and this presented problems for staff in accessing and sharing accurate and up-to-date information in a multidisciplinary setting. Next slide, please. Thanks, Anthony. Um, as we've actually touched upon, I think one of the key things that, that actually came out of our work was that um, in terms of the interviewees that we that we talked to, a real challenge in ensuring that they were informed early enough in the discharge planning process that a home that somebody might be returning to was actually fit, um, or in terms of the environment, you know, for them. Um, and that, you know, within, within that environment, people might, you know, were able then to support that, that person in the home. Um, in one hospital setting where we talk to people, a uh, number of patients were being referred to as service to clean and clean. And this was about engaging somebody else from the team that was involved in, in actually the wider process of discharge planning, having a look at the home environment, being able to carry out an independent assessment effectively, uh, uh, just in terms of the condition of the property. Um, to be with, clearly indicated to us that that, that that helped them in the discharge planning because very often, I think as we touched on just now, the, the picture paint may not be accurate. Um, there's a clear, there was a clear drive and desire for patients to actually want to return home. You know, um, but people were saying to us that finding out later wasn't soon, did create a problem in being able to discharge people home and could cause a process of delay in 12 months. Um, and this is particularly the case where people may have had a complex health um, or where the property might need further work and um, some process of, of, of what the home needed to look like. So things um, from, from ward based staff, a bit of confusion about what was being classed actually as a housing issue. I think we had a view that some of the to us about the home not being suitable, the home being cluttered, those sorts of things were not necessarily consistently seen by hospital staff as housing issues. Our view was that, well, that's clearly an issue that relates to somebody's housing. Therefore, it's something that needs to form part of the broader assessment. Um, and I think within that, there seemed to be an overlap then 
between staff based in community settings um, where further work probably needs to be done to link up the work that's done with the, with the work that's done with teams actually based in the community so that things like OT assessment should happen in a timely manner. If there's a process of adaptations needed by housing associations, that could perhaps happen a little more quickly as, as actually part of the process. Um, and at the same time, hospitals could, could introduce a bit around the timing of the discharge. We came across a number of examples where people were saying people were discharged home late in the evening to a cold house where there's no food, all of those sorts of things. Um, but I think, you know, probably with this was that was that um, it's clearly a challenge for hospital staff who are primarily setting up the process of discharge plan um, where they have actually what the patient tells them and that having the intervention of other expert advice in that process. Um, I'll just hand you back to Anthony I think for the next section. You're on mute, Anthony. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the timing and involvement of other organisations in planning, of the discharge cases that are referred to local authority housing departments, 19 of the 22 respondents working in a housing service in housing services said that they were either occasionally or frequently involved far too late in the discharge planning process. Of the seven housing associations that took part in the interviews, five stated that they were involved too late or even not at all. Um, one interview indicated that there needed to be an understanding that discharge can be complex and operate on different levels and that one size does not fit all. A common view shared by interviewees was that organisations need to work together and to develop different pathways that reflect, accommodate and plan for differing levels of complexity, both in relation to the health, housing and social factors that may impact on general well-being. These may take the form of addressing longer term mental health and well-being needs and the need to address people feeling safe at home, but also looking at the issues relating to social isolation and loneliness. At a strategic level, interviewees raised the need for all partners to engage in a delayed transfers of care conversation in establishing the role housing plays in addressing the issue. Interviewees indicated that it is equally important to establish clear pathways and mutual understanding across differing organisational disciplines and functions. However, by contrast, where constructive joint planning and coordinated working has led to the creation and funding of dedicated teams and posts to improve hospital discharge, local authority staff in Cardiff and the Vale of Glamorgan reported not seeing significant issues with addressing discharge planning. Excuse me. Equally in Torvine, staff from the housing team reported that joint working has facilitated them being invited to relevant discharge planning meetings and that they also operate a social care and housing complex case panel that meets monthly. Housing staff with housing expertise employed by health services and working to an integrated model in the majority of discharge cases leads to the right housing advice being provided and housing providers being engaged and involved in a timely manner. Back to you, Greg. Thank you. It might sound a little obvious to, say, to, to, to kind of pose a question as to where people sit um, in all of this planning process as a patient, but I think quite clearly to us through, through the period of our work and through the interviews that we undertook, um, communicating with patients and ensuring that the patient's voice is heard within the discharge planning process was really important. Um, I think we, we, we had a clear understanding that any planned or unplanned period of time in hospital is a traumatic experience for many people for a range of different reasons. Um, but ensuring that, that the patient's voice was heard and ensuring that the patient fed into the discharge planning process um, did seem to present a number. Um, I think we, was, we were certainly struck that um, where they could involved uh, in, in, in planning in terms of the hospital discharge put the patient at the and it was a matter of generally dealt with very sensitively um, um, and I think there was lots of access to things like you know the language lines speech therapists those sorts of um, and certainly with um, people that we see within social work team um, they, with the patient having the patient at the heart of things has been really integral and key to ensure 
the process worked well. It was really important that the patient understood what was happening to them and how the actual discharge process worked. Um, and very often with social services staff were acting as advocates on, and actually for um, both with hospital staff and also staff actually working out in the community. Um, but I suppose from that, one of the things that we see was that there didn't seem to be a, a, a consistent approach to the way that people were communicated with in terms of the discharge process. Um, as personalised, as I've said, um, and I think that, that was overlaid by some of the patient and care of feedback that we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, was that 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 consistent involvement and patients, families, and carers? Um, it it didn't always happen in the most coherent and joined up way. So, um, was that families and carers would be the people be on the receiving, receiving end very often in terms of the discharge planning process, and by that I they would be the ones that would be ensuring that once the patient had returned home that the home environment was safe and it was suitable the person had food all of those sorts of things as well as being the key link in looking to coordinate some of the aftercare arrangements for that um and i think a, a clear thing out from the interviewees that we spoke at and sectors was that it would, it would be really helpful if families and carers were also involved at a very early stage in, in the actual plan. Um, and that in terms of the language that's used, given that most patients, carers and families don't work in the sector, clear language that um, is, is not necessarily clinical or in terms of avoiding the use of jargon, those sorts of things, but explaining things to people in a very clear and concise way would, would certainly help in terms of the planning process. Back to you, Anthony. Thanks, Greg. Okay, so in terms of discharge outcomes and how the needs of patients were met following discharge, advance notice to local authorities when a patient will be homeless on discharge in cases where the what matters assessment identifies a possible housing need can be critical in ensuring that the outcome from hospital discharge is a positive one. However, even where a homelessness prevention officer was based at a hospital and spent time introducing themselves to ward staff. Our research found examples where it is not unusual for the housing aspect of the what matters referral or of discussion to not be prioritised and that patients can be discharged who are not known to the council's homelessness team. However, the following is probably the most significant finding from our research and underpins the basis of many of our recommendations. 31 out of 52 interviewees confirmed that they had concerns regarding patients being discharged to unsafe or insecure environments, with a further two respondents stating that the environment was not necessarily unsafe, but was unsuitable. Of the 31 interviewees, 16 respondents, who were mainly housing bodies, gave late notification or involvement as the primary cause of the discharge being unsafe. Nine respondents, who were mainly from the health and social care, uh, sector gave the reason that patients with capacity had the right to make their own decisions, but some of those decisions were not necessarily considered to be in their best interest. The remaining seven interviewees gave reasons such as an over-reliance on patient information, which as previously mentioned was not always true or accurate, and consequently resulted in some needs being unmet. The most common reasons for respondents saying discharge was unsafe are as follows. Patient discharge into temporary accommodation that was not suitable for a patient's needs. This is of particular relevance for patients with a mental health condition being charged into bed and breakfast or hostel accommodation, where other residents with substance misuse or offending behavior presented an unsuitable environment. Patients returning to properties that were not deemed safe or habitable, normally circumstances where the patient wanted to return home. Patients being discharged back to properties where the required arrangements in relation to equipment, care packages or adaptations had not been put in place or carried out. And finally, patients being discharged back to properties that were no longer suitable to their needs. For example, a two-story house where the patient was no longer able to climb stairs. Interviewee responses indicated that the involvement of social services in discharge planning resulted in far fewer patients being discharged into unsafe or insecure accommodation settings. However, it was not uncommon to hear that housing departments and housing providers would refuse to accept the patient being discharged, explaining that they had not been given sufficient time to prepare 
and the discharge would subsequently be unsafe. In some cases, cited by interviewees, ambulance crews had to return the patient to hospital. Many interviewees stated that hospital readmission was far more likely in cases where the discharge was rushed or poorly planned and without the relevant people being involved. However, um, virtually all interviewees described the importance of and reliance on their existing network of services and resources during, but especially following discharge. Respondents described how social services, CMHTs, the third sector and especially organisations delivering service through the housing support grant play a huge role in meeting the physical, mental health and ongoing wellbeing needs of patients once they are back in their community. Next slide, please. Thanks, Anthony. Um, looking at the impact of COVID, I think we all understand that we've, we've been living through a pretty unique set of circumstances over the last 18 months. And I think certainly from some of the survey feedback, um, we were struck by how adaptable and flexible organizations, teams and individuals had been in, in, in dealing with a set of circumstances that was really unprecedented. I think it was also interesting that um, COVID wasn't necessarily used as an excuse for not doing things, or COVID wasn't necessarily at the forefront of people. So I think all that, and quite clearly, um, an awful lot of work had been put in place through protocols, through practical working, working arrangements, um, to take account of COVID. Um, but it, it, it certainly wasn't sort of placed perhaps at the forefront um, of the conversations that we had, maybe because um, people that got used to working in, as we said, a, a pretty unique quite environment. Um, I mean, one of the things that were flagged up in terms of housing staff working um, in local authorities was that um, um, they were they were often dealing with issues where people would be discharged from to make a homeless as it was viewed. Um, um, this then meant that board staff had to phone ahead um, and that introduced a more coordinated planned um, roadmap uh, in terms of the way that discharge could be dealt with and addressed. Um, I think the impact is things that, I, that I'll talk you through now that are, that are, that are positive and maybe some that are good and maybe not quite as positive. Um, I mean, certainly the, the, the impact of the Welsh Government's temporary removal of priority um, and also the fact that it took steps to everybody who was rough sleeping were both seen as hugely positive. Um, but it the, the impact of that was that certainly uh, talked to us and said that um, a common theme of well, their temporary and in terms of their supported accommodation was generally full. Um, in terms of the use of B and B um, had. had, had this then had a knock-on effect where, that, that, where people in hospital um, may be delayed in terms of the transfer of care or may be delayed in terms of because the choice of options that housing staff had as, where, as to where they were being taken up. On one hand, a really positive move around people who were sleeping birth were really vulnerable. That need was actually addressed, but that, that clearly had an impact um, in terms of other be around being able to discharge people from hospital into, as we've said, suitable and safe environments. Um, as a positive, however, um, people stated that, that the through COVID, that the red tape that they that they had worked through, and some of the, the processes that were streamlined, some of it through the introduction of COVID measures, um, had, had actually helped. In, in making their, their, their everyday kind of working life, their everyday processes that they had to go to simpler um, and pretty much more um, impactful as well. Um, it was a clear challenge. People, as I said, were really flexible and have been able to adapt as we all have, I think, in terms of online contact, video calls, those sorts of things. But I think one of the flip sides coming out of that, certainly from, from housing staff was that that kind of loss of face-to-face -face personal contact just did present about being able to establish working relationships with with people who heard to them as patients that loss of that human interaction was clearly for them um you know clearly on the way that they were able to undertake planning the whole process of hospital discharge and um, a further impact where um specialist staff as we've 
banking expertise who would have previously been paid where they were not able to go to those hospital wards because of the impact of COVID. We're having to relay information two ways into the hospital around the discharge planning process, back out of the hospital in, in, into, into ensuring that all of that worked. And that was usually having to be relayed through colleagues who may not have been experts in housing. Um, so it added a bit of a further complication in, in terms of the discharge planning pathway. Um, but I think clearly overall, as a comment, um, as I've said, certainly the and the ways that people have have um, taken unplanned, unplanned work working together is something that, that I think needs to be taken forward. And I think that's something that does feed in, in one of the recommendations that we are going to talk to you about a little bit later. Um, Clearly within, I think as I said earlier on, making sure that the patient voice was heard was really, really important. Um, and linked to that certainly was the role that families and carers, and that they're often interlinked, they're often, they often carry out that same function. And just getting, getting that into how housing advice works and how the housing discharge planning process works was really important. And I, and I think a consistent theme around hospital discharge um, was that it was always an issue. And that even though carers under the Social Services Wellbeing Act um, have a legal framework um, within which they, they, they can be heard through the, 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 the um, formal requirements, actually, in terms of a carer's assessment to be done, um, to us certainly was that discharge planning can be postcode based. It's a bit of a lottery. It depends on perhaps particular contacts, it depends on what, you know, what may be available in terms of resources, those sorts of things. Um, and certainly from a, from a patient and carer perspective, there were instances where people felt under pressure due to COVID um, that the discharge process happened a little more quickly than perhaps it should have. The challenge, particularly within a community setting where some of the um, to support people being able to you know, be able to live at home, um, it was comp. There was a shortage of PPE. I think we all know about that. Actually, within that broad kind of social care and setting, which meant that the home care teams um, there were concerns about them being able to work safely in a home environment when somebody had actually come out of. Um, I mean, certainly from our experience of the. The surveys that we that, that we we undertook, um, sixty eight percent of a partner or a family member person at the receiving end discharge planning and arrangements. And I mean, I mean having to lead on ensuring that the whole is fit for that person to be able to return home. Um, I think very often from patient this work was that. Um, clearly, discharge planning focuses on the expectations of patients. Um, but as one person said to us, patients are very often desperate, and that may influence the way that this actually happens. Um, from that, carers particularly had concerns. I think as Anthony just said, this happening, um, where there may be concerns around a person, maybe concerns around physical health needs, um, and the that person was being sent back to. Um, and I think the interviewees from patients and care at discharge for when people go into hospital. Um, and that really speaking, that they for their voice to be heard actually, and, and that from that, actually the carer's assessment should form a key part of any hospital discharge planning and that housing needs should be reflected within that. The challenge is within the carer's assessment there's no formal and as one, one person spoke to us and, and that there's a carrot in terms of the legislation but it's not a stick because it doesn't actually apply in a health settings so something there to you think about look at our research um, of, of, of what Anthony has, has taken through um, is, you know, based on interviews, um, but we also um, undertook um, a series of online questionnaires uh, um, in a send them up possibly because of COVID. 
but we sent out um, a number of online survey questionnaires uh, to housing staff, to health staff, the social services staff, to carers and patients as well. 17 did give us a bit of a snapshot coverage of Wales. Um, what patients and carers around that was that 64% of the people who responded um, through, through that means had directly been involved in hospital discharge planning and arrangements with 50% of those people you know, saying that they, they, had, they, they were either a patient or had actually been one. Interestingly enough, 84% of the people who responded reported that their hospital stay was due to a physical health need um, and that 56% of the people who responded were actually owner-occupiers. Um, only 6% of people who, who um, indicated that they had been homeless at the point of going into hospital. Um, very staying for less than a month and a further 28 percent of people staying in hospital for less than a three-month period. Um, it, with regard to 62 percent of respondents reported that they were asked about their housing needs and the housing situation which is a part that else primary lead on that so seven of, of people starting that conversation about housing need were um, people employed in that health role. I suppose a more concern is that 60 that they were only asked about their housing situation at the end of their period of time in hospital, with only 15% of people saying that that conversation took place at a very early stage. Um, and again, from that, 33% of those individuals that, that, they, that they fully understood how the actual planning process worked, um, but almost of those people didn't really involvement as a patient in that planning program concerned that they would their needs have actually be taken into consideration. consideration. Um, um, looking on a bit further as uh, the role of, of families, friends, partners, um, often acting in a in a in a in a caring really clear in the sixty eight percent of um, people involved in the survey. Um, you know, we're actually from that vast group. Looking at in terms of communication, and you know, as we talked earlier on, this being really key to so clarity around what is happening in 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 the whole process. Centre responded indicated to us that they weren't offered information in a range of formats. Um, so, um, and I think from from looking at, at at the information that was available, it was unusual to find something public format. Um, bearing in mind, obviously, with the caveat, we were doing a lot of this online, but it was it was quite rare to find anything in a public format that explained anything around uh, how discharge worked. Um, reflecting on the plans, um, people said back to us that, that, that 34 percent of people said that they felt that what was put in place for them was an arrangement. Um, 50 percent of people said that. And the outcome, um, as far as the process went for them, it, it was okay. Equal 50 50 split in terms of respondents saying that, that you know, whether they were listened to or weren't. So it's difficult, I guess, to draw a conclusion from that. Um, and 56% of people responding to the survey said that there'd been no change in their housing situation post, post their time period in hospital. Um, and again, just um, who came that the impact of COVID you know, wasn't a, a, a key issue for them uh, just in terms of, of planning around um, them actually coming out of the hospital in a planned way. Um, just moving on to the recommendations. We've got a set of recommendations. So we'll need the next slide um, for this, please, Sarah. Um, and I'm going to hand over Anthony, who's going to talk you through the first five of those. Thanks, Greg. I think it's important um, to mention a few things before we go into the recommendations. And I think that's really around how COVID impacted on one, our ability to engage um, enough health staff uh, or health professionals in the research. We would like to have you know, spoken to a lot more, but also the depth of how, you know, how deep our research could go into in terms of understanding the assessment and discharge planning processes. 
Um, and there's no doubt that there are some very, very good discharges taking place, uh, that, you know, where housing needs have been effectively identified. Um, but I think going back to that statistic where so many respondents, the majority of respondents had concerns about people being discharged into unsafe or insecure environments, I think it's important to say that the first few recommendations are all about the assessment and discharge planning process. Um, and I think it just recognises, though, that, you know, I think when, when, with so many respondents saying they had concerns, that those two aspects could be reviewed. And we're saying they should be reviewed because they may be working very well, but they may be there may be areas for improvement. So um, our first recommendation, uh, we felt that Welsh Government, uh, and, and again, these recommendations are in kind of order that we felt they should be carried out as well. Uh, so that the we felt that Welsh Government should lead on ensuring that a definition of housing advice is more widely shared and disseminated among professionals and across disciplines in order that it forms the basis for the assessment of housing needs with patients. And we feel they should consider the multiplicity of language and terminology used to both describe the discharge process and to identify professionals involved in discharge. It would be beneficial if a commonality of understanding could be developed to ensure that misinterpretation around professional roles or discharge arrangements does not occur. The use of a clear set of terms, definitions or descriptors, such as our definition, could be a useful aid in this. Uh, we also feel that um, it's important to note the value of establishing clarity of definition as a tool to reinforce the importance that housing advice plays in the discharge process. Next slide, please. Uh, our second recommendation, uh, health boards, relevant housing bodies, which include local authority, housing departments and housing associations, and other, and other partners such as social services, care coordinators and community connector teams, should review the assessment that is used when patients are admitted and identify and confirm the importance that housing plays in an effective discharge, in effective discharge planning, adopt a clear understanding of the language being used relating to housing, resulting from recommendation one, confirm what is housing related within the assessment, ensure it covers all aspects of a patient's housing situation, ensure it addresses the needs and capabilities of carers when they are or could be involved, agree how to approach or escalate the assessment when patients are vague or possibly not being accurate in describing their housing situation, confirm essential information that health staff need to be aware of regarding housing issues relating to discharge, specifically information that assists housing bodies in managing expectations regarding to housing options. We feel it should identify whether the allocation or even reallocation of staffing resources at the stage of assessment, particularly housing assessment, could offset additional time and resources being expended later in the discharge process or even when a patient is readmitted. And finally, identify the training or resources required to ensure health staff are competent in carrying out the housing aspect of the assessment. Next slide, please. So uh, recommendation three, health boards, relevant housing bodies and other key partners, as mentioned above, uh, should review when and how the assessment is carried out and used and consider the timing of the assessment, consider the, the consistency of conducting the assessment with different staff, wards and hospitals, confirm the best approach to how the housing aspect of the assessment is updated to reflect the changing health needs of the patient Identify who is best placed to provide the right housing advice when it is required, considering the various case studies and other options provided with the appendices of our report. Establish an effective notification or referral mechanism that health staff need to trigger when housing needs and carer involvement are identified or where a lack of understanding of a patient's housing situation may, ad may adversely affect their discharge. <coughs> Excuse me. Confirm how to decide when the optimum time for discharge planning is to be initiated for each patient, reflecting on the various challenges we've previously mentioned. Agree how the patient's housing related needs are then considered within the discharge planning process. Confirm how those relevant housing bodies or experts are then consistently involved within the discharge planning process to ensure the best advice is provided. Establish how carers are brought in and involved in the discharge planning process. 
identify how those relevant housing bodies or experts are updated in line with the changing health needs of a patient and agree how to identify the most appropriate known point of contact within wards and hospitals for community-based services uh, that, that can facilitate effective and efficient communication relating to discharge. Next slide, please. Recommendation four. Again, health boards, relevant housing bodies and other key partners should review whether the integration of services involved in hospital discharge is beneficial and possible and consider how to overcome conflicting priorities, policies and frameworks, how information can be shared most efficiently and effectively, whether joint funding services or posts is viable and beneficial, whether the sharing of multiple or single IT resources is possible bearing in mind the, the inconvenience that some interviewees commented on in terms of using multiple IT systems, and also developing an automated referral or notification mechanism to housing bodies and care coordinators upon housing needs being identified. Next slide, please. Recommendation number five, health boards should review the impact of how the pressures and priorities placed on ward staff to free up hospital beds can lead to rushed and poorly planned discharges, given consideration to ensuring the wider causal factors of admission have been resolved, the negative impact on the patient if discharge is not addressed adequately, the negative impact on families and carers, and the potential avoidable cost to the NHS associated with readmission to hospital. Uh, next slide, please, and back to Greg. Thanks, Anthony. Um, yes, yeah, so recommendation six is that uh, health boards and local authority housing departments should review. Um, and I think this covers really the needs of patients, particularly with a mental health issue that we referred to earlier on, um, where they, they may enter um, hospital for a period of assessment, um, but they're not formally admitted into hospital um, and that don't form necessarily part of a discharge planning process. So there's a clear need to ensure that and in terms of local departments, explore there's a housing need to clearly identify how those needs are met. Um, there should be an indication, I think, around how the engagement of carers and families in the whole planning process. I think some of the evidence that we talked about earlier on is that there's often an assumption that families acting in a caring role um, would pick up things, as we said, at, at, the, at the other end of the discharge planning process. Um, how those families and carers are engaged in the process. Um, and health boards and authorities really could, should, could explore working together about how they create the space for the carer's assessment to be undertaken from day one in the context of planning somebody's discharge um, and that housing need as it's identified that process as well. Um, Came across an indication from carers associations that they were willing to provide awareness around the, the actual role and the value that carers can have process of being able to plan. Um, and I think you know one of the things, as we said, that you know that to be explored. Uh, next slide, please. Health boards should review how expert staff with housing knowledge and information can remain linked and accessible to patients, family members, carers, and in the current COVID climate. As we said earlier on, where the involvement in face-to-face -face is compromised um, by the whole COVID environment. This would, we feel, ensure that communication um, and that the patient need changes as it often can between hospital and coming out and within the whole discharge planning process details around changing patient need upon housing options should be laid reorganize the planning process in a, in a timely way to ensure that the discharge um, works as best as it next slide please as well the role of area planning um, who we felt could have a key addressing what, what came through as a she was around. Where does the responsibility sit for addressing some of the wider needs that people may have? This might be around isolation and loneliness. This might be low level um, issues in terms of 
general health and well-being in terms of mental health and well-being. We felt that area planning well, should take lead bringing all organisations involved in the discharge together to explore and hopefully um, identify practical answers to, to address those broader issues. Because um, from the work that we did, those was an important factor in how well people did respond as patients in the whole planning um, um, coming out of hospital. Um, and I think we fully appreciated within that this whole that that whole sort of range of issues. If you sit with one organisation, um, and it might involve a range of organisations providing a range of different interventions, and we felt as a separate area planning board could have a key role in that. Next slide, please. So the next recommendation to some degree indicated on, on the successful completion of what we've identified in the first date. Um, and from this, we, we felt that, that health boards, housing bodies, and other key partners, as we've previously identified, should review or even put in place discharge protocols. Um, and I think this is something that, as we talked about earlier on, we felt that, that there was clearly a gap, or we felt that, that those protocols needed to be put in place in a timely way. Um, and that it needed to engage people within a hospital with people working out, out with patients in the community with a view to getting hospital discharge right first time. Uh, health boards and housing bodies could also lead on carrying out a biannual process review of protocols. Have they been implemented? Do they work? Be changed? And we felt that that would also provide an opportunity for all of those organisations to identify what works well, to identify barriers, provide means to deal with any issues that, that um, any of them face. Um, and again, you know, the, the idea of having a clear protocol that finds and identifies what the hospital discharge planning process is, ensures that the, that the process of hospital discharge is and effective. Uh, so please. This is the last set of uh, of what we put together in terms of recommendations, um, felt that from this that the Welsh government should lead on the following. Really, um, it's clear that that the practice of there, um, there's been a lot of good practice examples um, seen. So, in terms of the Welsh government, could could lead on pulling that together um, in terms of practice guidance, share with organisations involved. In Expert knowledge that that key kind of learn experience really. We were quite clear that all partners engaged in the process were working the same goal, um, but it felt at times that 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 process um, might have been a little disarranged. People might not have been aware of an area that would help them. But they actually may have they actually may have been facing. Um, and again, for the Welsh government, um, we felt that they could have a key role in being able to promote that good practice. Uh, um, it was quite surprising to us that that we, in the way that hospital discharge in health board areas, and it did even vary within the same kind of hospital. So again, I think a real opportunity here to bring together some good practice examples and actually learn from that. Um, and coming out of the next, just in terms of COVID, as we've said, um, we were struck uh, as I, as I, uh, how flexible and adaptable people have been in a really challenging working environment. So it would be a shame if those gains were actually lost about a process moving more efficiently and actually found that. Um, and again, you know, it's a bit of a theme here that again, we're talking about the Welsh government leading on, on we've learned through the whole COVID period. And, and how that, that can help inform system change. And the final thing I think for us is about you know, the use of temporary accommodation, as we've, as we've talked about previously, um, how, how that is involved, how that's used in discharge. Um, you know, we have had and temporary accommodation, um, its function, its form, the environment, offers to people coming out of hospitals. So we think that in terms of Welsh Government should really undertake an urgent analysis of the use of that form of 
in the whole. Um, and again, there's a, it's an effective use of the horses. If this charge works well, we'll get it right first time. Um, I mentioned the, of the main body of the report. I don't know whether people, whilst we've been speaking, have had a look at the report as it's as it's been popped up into your chat box. Um, there are other areas, obviously, we can talk about some of the background, our approach, in terms of the methodology we've used as well, those sorts of things. Some of the, you know, some of the issues that we that we that we kind of bumped into. Um, but I think generally we, we would like to thank um, Kath and Matt and the team um, just in terms of the support that we've had in the project and particularly everybody who was engaged with us. Um, we, we, we spoke to an awful lot of people who were very busy and they freely gave up their time. Um, so, you know, we'd just like to say thank you to all of those people. Um, and we've been really struck about, you know, the great work that is out there that's actually going on um, around planning people's hospital discharge home, which is trying in the best of circumstances, and 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 you know for people to be doing that in the midst of a pandemic is 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 pretty outstanding. Um, so I think that's all that we want to say. There is a set of appendices as well where we include some tables and some uh, and some background information. Um, we provide a, a couple of case studies uh, from interviews as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's I guess over to you guys now and any questions that you may have for us. Thank you both. That was really interesting. Um, I really enjoyed kind of hearing your perspectives um, and understanding more about kind of some of the challenges also still kind of interesting. Um, I was really struck there was great in some of the questions coming up. There was a comment in the chat about, which was really interesting, about the need for <coughs> bigger, longer term <coughs> sorry, adaptions. Um, so for people accessing um, disability facilities grants, for example, for stair lift installations, um, you know, kind of um, processes that can take a minimum of six weeks. Um, and I think that's a really interesting example of how can we, generally we, um, plan for these sort of unexpected eventualities but i say unexpected but they, they happen on a fairly regular basis as people age in the place as people um you know have various instances that mean they might need something like a stair lift you know it feels like long term it's always a surprise when this happens and what can we be doing about that sort of generally to try and overcome some of that surprising element of it i think um one of the um things that came up from my interviews and it wasn't coming up a lot to be fair but what was coming up was the option to use step down accommodation so obviously people sometimes as we as we've heard do get put back into a property or discharged back into properties that aren't quite ready um, but in the Vale of Glamorgan I believe the NHS had funded I think in partnership with the housing association some step down properties that were basically used to discharge patients into whilst they're own accommodation was being brought up to the standard or adapted to the to the way it needed to be. Um, that was one one solution possibly. And I think from that, just just certainly some of the things that I picked up from um, you know from talking to people were that you know it, it was often the case that a person um, being in hospital as a patient may have been in the home environment or being in a home environment that would be really unsuitable for their wider health needs for some considerable time um, so that but but that person may not have been engaged actually with other services for a whole range of reasons the point of that person entering hospital which might be quite a but all of the issues actually came to light so i think yeah we were certainly appreciated the challenge that it's not just around hospital discharge about getting somebody home that in itself is a challenge it's it's the other stuff that that, that, that that might sit under that. So you have you know, to say you may have people who've been not engaged with services, living in a quite desperate housing situation for some period of time, impacted by a wide range of issues in terms of isolation, those sorts of things. And again, we we, we certainly came across a couple of examples where particularly elder patients were happier remaining in hospital about actually going home. Journey around the I think the whole issue is social needs has a huge impact 
And I think it's about where ability to pick up on some of those things actually sit, because it may not be perceived as a housing issue, but it's clearly impacting these housing situations. Thank you. That's, that's really interesting about that kind of reminder that housing is part of the when it comes to this care kind of model that we're you know, keen to see developed and that it's absolutely about seeing the person at the centre of it, isn't it, really, rather than the, the, the needs always. Uh, the questions are coming in thick and fast. I've got two here. Um, if that's OK, I'll read those to you. Uh, so we've had a question in from Adam Harper. Thank you, Adam. Did you come across many cases where discharge planning was protracted due to the differing expectations of parties involved? We come across this a lot in housing with patients and professionals. So that's a really good one. And then Jacqueline Duncan's come in um, asking, what is the extra care model like in Wales? We call step down facilities neighbourhood apartments, which are funded by the local authority. So that's interesting to see how much that's also reflected in Wales or possibly different. I think possibly going going back back to Adam's question, first of all, um, I think Anthony can 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 comment on on some particular areas around that. I mean, certainly from a patient point of view, I think we were you know we were clearly struck by the fact that um, you know housing discharge people you know I, I think I, I I put that in a quote earlier. People are and that and drive that process of discharge planning, and that within that. Um, I think there was a view from staff working with patients that very often or them having to manage expectations was clearly an issue. The patient, they don't like being in hospital, um, but they will perhaps find what those hazards can be, particularly if, if we, as we just talked, we need to address longer term issues, a real challenge. Um, COVID did overlay that with, we talked to whether it was a, drive to get people out of hospital as quickly as possible. Sort of complicated factors there, but I think probably some things he did. You could probably feedback some more on that answer. Hey, you're on mute. Yeah, just going to um, Adam's question. There really was a huge mixed picture of. Um, the different way discharges were delayed or happened really effectively. Um, I heard one um, medical professional say that they wished that the um, approach to planning in Wales was more similar to in England, because in Wales we've given more uh, control to the patient to customise or, or sort of have more control and influence over their discharge than they do in England. Um, this particular health professional felt that it delayed the process here far more because there were far more issues to consider because that's what the patient wanted. Um, apparently in England, they don't have that same element of choice and control and therefore discharge planning takes place a lot quicker and in some respects a lot easier. Obviously, though, you know, you've know you got that balance there between meeting individual and patient need and personalising their discharge over the speed of how, you know, the speed of getting discharges pushed through. Um, it also brought in the whole issue around how families can get involved and also impact on that discharge taking place either sooner or later. Um, and again, you know, I think just having different housing bodies involved, some saying, no, we're not ready. Um, RSL saying, no, we're, we're, we've only just found out about this. We've, we've got to get all these different packages or adapt, 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 adaptations put in place. So there, there really was a huge mixed picture, to be honest, yeah. Um, step down, yeah, in terms of the, the, the extra care model, it, it didn't come up a lot, to be honest, the whole extra care um, situation. Um, but what was useful was knowing that we do have one example of where the, the health um, the NHS had funded um, these step-down um, units and in the neighbouring county, uh, county borough, she, the, the person I spoke to was very interested to know how that could happen. So clearly there was a demand for it. However, in the Vale where it's currently happening, it was being funded year on year. So it did lack that sort of um, longevity in terms of how it can be used and planned for. Thank 
thank you. That's really interesting. Um, I suppose we've had another quest, uh, kind of point made in from Jacqueline about um, that actually delays are often the simple issues. So the example of needing a key safe to be fitted so carers can gain access. Um, I've certainly heard of stories where it's quite a simple adaptation, but then leads to a huge amount of delay. Um, and again, I suppose that all comes back to that. How do we start preparing for these things so it isn't a surprise when it happens? And I think you know, the recommendations that you've, you've brought to life today really do kind of sum up some of that. But some of the answers are right in front of us in some ways. Um, so the final question for me then would be just about in terms of the recommendations and the findings, is there something in particular that you think would really move, move this along? Because this isn't a new issue, that's something we're all aware of. This isn't a new area. So what is it, what would be the kind of first step that would really start to make a difference in this area? For me, I think, I think it's the getting a very clear system in place of understanding that the patient's needs recognizing whether there is a housing need and making sure that that referral takes place at the most optimum time and i say optimum because through the research it was clear that it, it isn't a straightforward simple process especially when patients have got changing health needs throughout their stay in hospital the majority of people i spoke to said they wanted to know in the earliest part of that patient stay in hospital one social worker though did actually say no i don't want to know until the last two weeks because you can spend a lot of time working on particular aspects of their discharge plan and then all of a sudden everything changes so you could end up wasting your time so i think it's just about recognizing when is the optimum time to identify the need and start planning um, recognizing the complexities involved and i think for me it would it would probably be about organizations individuals talking to each other and sharing experience because a lot of the themes that we were coming up with, you know, are, are issues that occur in a range of settings. And there are real good practice examples that people don't know about. It's not widely shared. Um, it sounds a simple thing. If we, if we all carried on talking to each other in a constructive way and sharing some of this experience, you know, ensuring that a hospital discharge works in the way that it, that it should and could do, shouldn't be too difficult and up to crack, but I've been around for probably far too long you, you, you know just just to understand that that that's that's kind of not a simple thing but breaking it down which is like what we tried to do in terms of the recommendations into what we think are areas that are achievable and doable i think the under, underlying thing there is about people sharing experience communicating good practice and being able to learn from that yeah i think it was clear. sorry i think it was clear where the the housing departments or and housing associations um, were in communication with the health board or hospitals. You know, they clearly put things in place that hugely assisted that discharge planning process, especially in terms of mental health patients. Um, but I think, you know, again, it's, it's keeping those those two different sort of sectors talking because the, uh, the areas where things weren't working so well, there clearly hadn't been that, that communication. Amazing. Thank you both. So I think that's a really good place to kind of draw to an end. Um, thank you everyone for listening and for your contributions to the questions. Please stay in touch. We will be sharing this report with Welsh Government and other decision makers. And we're keen to keep learning, keep understanding more about what we can all be doing. Um, and yeah, it just leaves me to say thank you to Greg and to Anthony and to everyone who contributed to their work. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.